For those who don't know me, I'm Ed Davis, I'm the Anglican and Coordinating Chaplain here at the University, and I'm really pleased to be hosting this event this year, Making Nothing Happen, an exploration of poetry and spirituality by five poet theologians, collectively known as the Diviners. Many of you will be familiar with this annual event organised by the Chaplaincy on behalf of the Spencer family, an event which seeks both to remember Anne Spencer, a much-loved daughter and sister and academic colleague, and to facilitate discourse between faith and academia and everyday life. And with those two aims in mind, it is a great pleasure to be hosting the Diviners at this, the 20th Anne Spencer Memorial event. Gavin has been closely involved with this event over many years, and it's great to have him centre stage this evening, along with Eleanor, Mark, Ruth and Nicola. I'll leave them to introduce themselves and their work, but just to mention that this event also has the honour of acting as a book launch for their collaborative work, Making Nothing Happen. You can see the picture here. Published by Ashgate just this month, and it will be available to buy just outside in the foyer after the talk. I should just mention, if you haven't noticed or been here before, the fire exits are um, at the back there on your right and back there on your left. Um, also, there are a few seats here at the front if you're finding it difficult to hear further back. So do come forward and take those if that's helpful. But I will now get out of the way and hand over to our poet, theologians. So let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you, Ed. Good evening, everybody. I'm Nicola Slee. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friends, poets and theologians, um, inhabiting different spaces within or on the edges of Christian tradition. Um, Gavin de Costa, who many of you will know, Professor of Catholic Theology here at the University of Bristol, well known for his work in interreligious dialogue and in other areas of theology. Eleanor Nesbitt, who is Professor Emeritus at the University of Warwick in Religions and Education, um, an ethnographer with particular interest in Sikhism, married into a Hindu family, um, and you'll hear some of that I think in her poems. Mark Price, who is an Anglican priest and bishop's advisor for clergy continuing ministerial education in the Diocese of Birmingham. Again, with very wide-ranging interests, he has published um, in the fields of poetry, particularly poetry um, as a resource for liturgy and for ministerial education. Ruth Shelton, who is Chief Executive at Emmanuel House, a home for the homeless in Nottingham. Um, Ruth, I guess, represents in our group the one whose feet is more firmly on the ground than the rest of us who are slightly more in the academic or church education world. Ruth has, again, very wide-ranging interests and has worked in a whole variety of fields, educational, social justice, um, and you'll hear, again, I think that reflected in some of her poetry. And myself, a research fellow at a small theological institution in Birmingham, the Queen's Foundation for Ecumenical Theological Education. I'm going to say just a little bit about the group um, and what we've tried to do in this book and then, and then just a summary of how we're going to proceed this evening. We can't remember exactly how long we've been meeting as a group. We think it's about a dozen years. Um, our first meeting was in Bristol, in Gavin's house, um, and we sat around and discussed whether there was enough of an agenda between our interest in poetry and theology to kind of make for a second meeting, and that was, you know, 12 or 13 years ago, so we have discovered that there is an agenda. We meet perhaps three times a year, usually for a day, we have some food together, we catch up on news, and we read each other poems and we comment on our poems 
and anything that arises out of our poems. We didn't have a name for quite a long time, but then in 2006, we were invited to, um, to conduct the morning service on Radio 4, the Sunday morning service. And, so we, and, and our producer told us we needed a name. So we drank a lot of wine and ate a lot of food and we bantered and we threw lots of names around and we ended up with the diviners or the diviners, however you want to pronounce it. And I'm just going to read from the introduction a reflection on um, the name and what the name perhaps might evoke. Our name evokes the divine as well as being suggestive of our shared conviction that poetry itself may be a form of divination a means of searching for the sacred, but also the means whereby we ourselves are searched out and our lives become the sacred ground in which the holy is discerned. Like water divining, poetry is a quest for the sources of life and renewal that the poet believes to be deeply embedded in the ground of his or her existence, yet which often remain elusive below the obvious surface of things, necessitating exploration in uncharted territory. Sometimes the poet and the poem strike lucky. The rock is struck, waters gush forth. Sometimes the poet returns thirsty and empty. The words refuse to come, or when they do, remain inert, obfuscating, dry. Poetry, no less than water divining, requires patience, practice, repetition, failure and return, as one works the terrain over and over, paying close attention to cartography, but knowing when the maps have to be abandoned in pursuit of the spring of life. I'm not actually going to say a great deal about why we've chosen a slightly mysterious title, Making Nothing Happen. You'll have to read the book to discover that. Um, but I will say a little bit about what we've tried to do in this book. We've tried, I suppose, to articulate in two forms, in prose and in poetry, something of our understanding or experience of the connections for us between poetry and faith or spirituality. And we've tried to do that in a rather earthed way rather than simply in a theoretical way. We've tried to reflect in our prose poems about our own writing practice, um, about what inspires our poems, about the process of writing, and how that may be theologically significant for us. And then we've tried to illustrate that with a series of our poems. There was a risk in attempting to do that. It's always a risk to articulate the rather mysterious process of creativity. But I think we found it a hugely enriching task both for ourselves individually, to seek to capture in prose something of the elusive writing process, but also to learn more about each other. We thought we knew perhaps quite a lot about each other's art and concerns, but in the writing of our essays we've discovered all kinds of other things about the others that we didn't know. So we want to share with you tonight something of um, our passion for poetry and faith, we want to read you some poems and reflect on them and thereby share with you just a little of our, our sense of what poetry can do. We're each going to have ten minutes to read you a few poems to say a little bit about them. And then after we've each read and spoken, Gavin will chair a time of questions and discussion. And I think, just in case you're feeling overwhelmed to clap at every poem, we might discourage you from doing that, just to make good use of the time. So if you do want to clap for some, we're not assuming that you do, but if you do, would you do it at the end of each person's um, little ten minutes? Thank you very much. So I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Gavin. to see you all, very special to make the journey tonight, especially in this kind of uh, bad weather conditions. So to honour the fact that you have 
made the journey to this event, I decided I would choose the theme of journey. And of course, journey lends itself very easily, I think, to a spiritual metaphor for a number of traditions. And the particular theme that in the Christian tradition from which I come, which I'm intrigued by, is this emphasis that it's not just the go, but actually the process of the journey that constitutes the arrival at a go. So there's this very interesting relationship between journey and end. And I want to just pick it up in a rather, I think, prosaic but telling sense, because uh, we all make journeys all the time. We don't necessarily invest great spiritual significance into it. Um, but what's always intrigued me is the fact that there's a quiet coach on British Rail, which is one of those rare moments we come together communally with a reverence for silence. And it only happens in libraries or churches or meditation halls. And of course, more often than not, it doesn't happen. So the first poem I'd like to read is called Quiet Zone. Despite the window stickers, a red slash across speakers, warning all, this is the zone of modernity's monastic space. A young woman takes a call. Since Darlington, a peace has reigned, unparalleled in so many a journey. A pre-lapsarian silence hung in carriageette. She speaks to a babysitter who has failed her. She's panicked in her calm. She speaks urgently to a friend seeking cover. She cannot return in time. Her child will have no home, no food. She will be jailed, all unsaid. But her calm is growing paler. No one, four calls later, can cover. A woman, middle-aged, with a marriage ring, breaks the tension between calls. Who do you bloody think you are? Call after call? I got a ticket to read in this carriage. Behave yourself, can't you? Did she have children? The silence changes tone, the fall from the peace zone. What if the tears of the child who stands adrift after school? What of her loneliness? The mother sits, silent in the quiet zone, staring through the pain. Such is the fragile peace of monasteries old and new. The um, second poem I've chosen is again about journeying. And this time it goes back to a, a childhood memory of a biblical story, which is still often called this in, in the New Testament. It's called the flight into Egypt, right? Which is the story about Jesus, Mary and Joseph traveling to Egypt. But with my very literal mind as a child hasn't changed terribly I used to envisage taking off at Jerusalem and landing in Cairo and I kind of wondered having been stopped so often by customs myself what it might have been like for the Holy Family to make a trip and encounter the UK border agency. <laughs> so this poem is called Flight into England. His black skin bleached in neon light. His wife, thin as a needle, feeds the child. Immigrants from Sudan are trouble. They all have incredible stories. They make you weep in sorrow or in mirth. 
deserts breed fantasy. Plastic chairs hold them in position, awaiting the UK border agency. Since she has a baby, a woman officer is also there to comply with laws that govern justice and drops of mercy. The baby worries the milk-dry breast. Why did you leave your country? Why bring your wife and child here? Questions worn thin from use. Three for the price of one includes a cradle snatcher. He's so, so old, and she's a teen with an eating disorder. The child sniffles, cries, gets pushed back upon the nipple. The officer smiles. The old man speaks in broken words that fall upon the table. An angel spoke me to leave, to fly England, was not here. His eyes are moist as if it hovered near. An angel? In your dreams? That was a story he had not heard. They swapped stories and this was new. Black angels. Do they tell you what to do all the time? Perhaps the medic should be called. The ebony man looked lost. He leant and touched his son gently on the head. They die children, he croaked. Are you claiming your family's in danger? A category, at last, that meant something. Somewhere to pass them, a box ticked. And for those who've come in late, just when I finish, then you can rush across and find a seat, okay? Okay, find a seat now and I'll stop my, my stopwatch. and final poem I want to read to you is about a journey that I take almost every week and it's a very repetitive journey and that's another thing about journeys uh, in terms of ritual and religion, one keeps repeating them again and again and uh, most Sundays I take the journey from the seat I'm sitting in at Mass to the front to reenact the goal of the journey every week. And obviously with repetitive rituals like this, there are all sorts of dangers. One is boredom, <laughs> indifference, lack of concentration. And of course, typically, one is supposed to prepare for this special event. Fasting, silence, prayer. But you can see from this poem that Again, things are not always as they should be. I call this poem Eucharistic Anamnesis. And the Anamnesis is the Greek term which relates to this making present that happens at the Eucharist. <coughs> Standing in communion queue, gazing at a flaking aged head with dank, dark, checked suit. At my right, a perfumed glass with rings galore and lips aflame. In front of her, stiff perm hair atop a tired, pleated skirt. I limp, one of the living dead, Catholics on the move.
I sense a crumb of toast lodged firmly as a rock against the mouth of my pre-molar's cave. My tongue, a grave digger's spade, works furiously near the gates of hell. Could the sight of his visit be shared with toast, the taste of egg and growing guilt? I raise my hands to receive him, absorbed at my power to hold God in a sweaty palm. In this giving, my lack disclosed, no fast, no preparation, but a hurried car chase, swearing at the old maid's jag, my broken tailgate wiper failed to yield a clear view. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. I realised as I tried to select some poems for this evening that I was carrying on something that I'm conscious of doing for a number of years, which is finding the unity between what sometimes looked like different aspects of, of my life. Um, and in particular, between poetry, which has been part of my life since I was at primary school and used to obsessively um, write things that rhymed. Um, and then, as well as the poetry, my professional life, which has been really important to me, mainly at the University of Warwick and mainly studying um, religious behaviour and how it gets transmitted and changed between generations... And then there's what gets called faith or spirituality, or sometimes I would refer to it in my own case as, <coughs> as Quakerism or the Quaker part of my life. And actually, I often find that it's in the poems that I discover that these are not different parts of my life. They're actually, it's just the same person who's in slightly different roles, but they all overlap. The first of these poems, some people here will already have come across. It's called Glastonbury and I wrote it after a visit with a professional organisation, the British Association for the Study of Religions. And I certainly wasn't expecting um, anything of a religious experience. I was on an outing um, with other academics. And actually the poem itself didn't come during that visit or straight after it. But something else I've noticed is that when I have an experience that brings a particular sort of emotion with it, there's an instant recall of a previous occasion, and then the poem that pours out is about that previous occasion very often. So that's what happened with this one. Um, I think it actually got written in the Lake District, but it's called Glastonbury. And here it is. We were no New Age travellers, pagans, pilgrims, Christians on retreat or on the march, but academics visiting the field. So there, where ley lines meet and Joseph walked and scholars theorise, we left the bus and went our several ways to ruined abbey, bookshops and the tour. Tourists now, happy eager to explore, but still constrained to analyse, impress, and never free to risk not seeming wise or smart. And there was I, unable to express or comprehend the torward pull, the purging and the peace. Inwardly changed and mute, tranquil, ecstatic, Free. I caught the bus and sat and heard myself attempt to joke and chat. With Quaker Meeting, it's a bit different. It's not like an outing with colleagues. There's an expectation that something might happen. There might be some connection with the transcendent or the spirit within 
I, on one occasion, I remember being one of those visitors who are sent to a new applicant who wishes to join the Religious Society of Friends. And this particular applicant was a lecturer in English. And one of the things that she said during this rather interview-like visit was, ministry is like writing poetry. So, the result of that was, in Quaker meeting, Ministry is like writing poetry, she said. And I agreed. But now, in meeting, heartbeat gathering speed, certain I have to stand and break unbroken, bonding silence. Then, relieved at having spoken, I think, is this what happens when a poem comes unbidden? propelled, ins insistent upon being written. Silence and clean white paper are alike receptive. The urgency, the imperative to write are as directive as feeling called to stand. <clears throat> Do verse and ministry well up from deep below or beckon from beyond a mystery? Each brings a resolution. Each seeks to resonate with kindred spirits, to communicate. Each flows from isolation to communion. A sacrament of heart and word in union. As well as my life involving the professional aspect, which doesn't seem very different now I'm technically retired, um, and the, the poetry and the faith dimension. There's also the fact that I'm part of a very diverse society, part of a religiously plural family. And as you heard, Sikhism has been one of my concerns um, as an academic. On one occasion... I was invited to Smethwick to speak in the Godwara. I don't know how often non-Christians get invited to speak in Christian places of worship, but certainly Sikhs are very generous in inviting others to, to speak if they sense a genuine interest. So I arrived at Smethwick Rolf Street Station, which is just about opposite the Godwara Sikh place of worship. And the result of that visit was this poem, which I footnoted, because should there be, really be a divide between different types of writing, poetry and academic writing? I don't know. I footnoted the Punjabi words as it happened. I didn't footnote Adelstrop, which is a reference, of course, to a famous railway station poem by Edward Thomas. In Smethwick Rolf Street... Remembering Adelstrop, I will be bold and write of Smethwick Rolf Street that October Sunday when the clocks went back. The bright low sun made paper silhouettes of sturdy trees. Sycamore leaves, golden, yellow, lime, spun pirouetting trackwards, and a silver squirrel leapt light foot along a gantry. Wind in tree sounds softly washed the track. A name like Dillon, Dunjal, Dhaliwal, Nagra, not Nesbit, would license me to pun in Punglish, Swedic's mother tongue. Punjabi metaphors drift from the Gordwara across the carriageway. Hunger for Lunga, Seva's fulsome flavour, and a Sangat congregation, washed by shimmering tides of hymns, the Kirtan, curtaining them from England, traffic graffiti, and a railway station, fleetingly wondrous as a woodland shrine. Perhaps it's appropriate that I conclude with, or almost conclude, with a railway station poem, coming as I do from Coventry, which I think has the unique standing of a railway station that has been written about 
in two internationally famous poems by two internationally famous poets. So I think along with the genre of religious poetry and comic poetry and so on, there is a railway station genre, and I'm part of it. But I'll finish with a prayer. And this is the earliest of the poems in the book from long, long ago in the 1970s. Prayer. God make me gentle where the world is hard for living. And where the world is harsh, God make me kind for loving. Thank you. Uh, lovely to be with you. My name is Mark. I'm the newest member of the group. Um, the, uh, the person who was in the group for me um, got a job at the Lambeth Palace and um, I, took, I took his place. <laughs> uh, as Nicola mentioned, um, part of my current ministry is to help priests become priests, which is a lifelong journey. And uh, when Ed was in our diocese, we worked together uh, in that task. So it's lovely to see Ed again. Um, and one of the things... Um, I try to urge priests to do is to get a feel for their parish. Um, uh, the trouble is, they probably now have about seven parishes, but nevertheless, to try and get a sense of place and a sense of the people. Sometimes we talk about uh, getting a sense of the terroir, the, uh, the deep structure and the deep flavour of, of a place. And um, poetry helps us pay attention and uh, to look more carefully. Sometimes prayer does that too. Uh, And that's where poetry and prayer perhaps overlap. Uh, And this is a poem about the uh, area of Birmingham which I live, Selly Oak. And there is a parade of shops there which I pass uh, walking home from the station. And there is a captivating, or at least I find it a captivating, ladies' outfitters, uh, which is situated (laughs) between a sauna and the butchers Um, and I've nearly been arrested several times um, gazing at this shop but it is fascinating because it's kind of it's left over from the 1950s and um, it has a a particular beauty this this shop window so um, this is a poem about uh, contours shop windows Celio like an older woman in the queue on this parade, too easily overlooked. Positioned as you are behind the bus stop, demure between the butcher's blare of blood red, fluorescent orange special offers, and manana saunas, neon lure, bubbling day and night above unyielding mirror glass and blanked out doors, whose signs say entrance at the rear. Your business is entirely apparent. And you have your own allure for retired headmistresses, for Barbara Pym, Miss Marple, and any sensible, independent-minded lady who will understand the quiet confidence of a sitting tenant, your art of being discreetly present from one rare purchase to another. For complete appreciation of your beauty, One must come at it obliquely and with special care, as if not to startle birds or children at play. Peering into your frontage requires the delicacy of dusting ornaments, moving a flower arrangement, undressing a corpse. You are all display, an unmistakable intention of availability, Almost any item which a customer might need, but no compulsion, just offering. Your deft, handwritten cards, set down so gently onto pastel colours, or propped against the softness and durability of reputable fabrics. Look how they finger their suggestions into folds of skin and purse, as comfort and economy make exquisite love of a hesitant kind in the sales talk of your labelling. And each 
with its own careful price. Twilfit, Excelsior, Court Royal, Fawn, Burley, Maturana, Exquisite Form, Playtex, Gossaro, Vedonis, White Swan, Contours, Nymphit, Aristoc, Pierre, Balmain, A Side Hook Girdle, A Summer Skirt, A Mock Quilt, Hose Coat, Pretty short sleeve tops, a fleecy bed jacket, a smooth cup, lined skirts and lovely jumpers, fawn roll-ons, cotton comfort, bed socks in assorted colours. Uh, everyone who, whose role it is to reinterpret the scriptures... Uh, on Sundays or whichever day it is that they're doing it, um, reimagines them, and um, often I do that through through a poem, as many as many priests and preachers do. Um, and here is one, uh, which is a, really a meditation on Luke's gospel, a meditation on Jesus. It's called the Sense of Him. The sight of him would be gentle light of a child's face, bright flame in cold dark warming us. The sound of him would be steady beat of the sleeper's breath, calm voice in a wild storm taming it. The smell of him would be unwashed, acrid from the road, fish off his friend's boats repelling us the touch of him would be rasp of workers calloused hands greys of rough cloth damp becoming glorious the taste of him would be sweet yeast of shared bread torn past desert food salt tears filling us. Mark's gospel, uh, when Jesus goes into the desert, um, it's only in Mark's gospel, he has a strange phrase, and he was with the wild beasts. And uh, there's a great uh, tradition of what, who were those beasts, what do those beasts stand for? He was with the wild beasts, and angels ministered to him. Who were those angels? What was the ministry like? And um, this is from uh, a meditation on those animals and those angels who were with the Christ figure in the desert. Um, The animals are, in this case, the black dogs of depression. Um, And the angel is the angel of sacrifice. The angry black dogs of depression and disillusionment. The last thing we expected was for you to befriend us. We tracked you for days at a distance, lurking behind, threatening, growling, needing you to fear us, to deny to yourself that we were there. But you called us down, you named us, stroked us like children. Let us lie around you, calm. With you there is no pretense, not even to self. And the anger which fuels us, this you acknowledge. And send bounding out to fetch back sticks for you, turned into play. The angel of sacrifice imparts the loving art of smell. Not the stench of cattle, sheep and doves that he longs for now, but the smell of the beloved, grasped firm, pulled close and held forever that unmistakable scent of skin, the breath, 
the hair. This is what God treasures. Well, good evening, everyone. It's very good to be here with you this evening. I'm going to start with a story from um, the end of my chapter, just to make sure you read all the way through to the end, um, which is about a man from where I, uh, who's from where I live, Nottingham, city of Nottingham. With a very, he's well known. He has a very dramatic lurching gait, and uh, with each lurch, he emits. Uh, a deep groan. His progress into the city is so slow that sometimes you can pass him, go shopping and come back and he's still painfully making his way down the hill. And I've conflated um, that story in my mind with a story that some of you may know about Muhammad wandering in the desert with his followers and one of those is lagging behind and groaning, he's hurt his foot. And another of Muhammad's companions says, can't you shut him up, he's getting on my nerves, I can't hear you speak. And Muhammad says, let him groan, for groaning is one of the names of God. And I I think in terms of poetry and the discussions we have, the diviners about what our poetry is trying to do, it seems to me there needs to be a bit of a groan, and that's certainly what I'm trying to do in my own writing. Not a groan of complaint, but that twinge in the sinew, so that you are um, identifying with or, or... Um, demonstrating some of the grief and loss which otherwise might not be articulated by a person or by a community, and joy and laughter too, which seems quite a high claim, Um, but poets do make high claims for poetry, and the rare occasions that contemporary poets poets appear on television, um, they often talk about poets writing about truth or touching upon truth, which is, I think those of us writing from within a, a Christian tradition would scarcely dare claim But I find it difficult to let go of the idea that somehow art in its time must have some kind of, give some kind of account of the age, and if it doesn't do so, it it is a failed enterprise. I mean, my preference is to think that poetry lives among us. I mean, I'm going to ask you something now. How how many days in November? (laughs) Yes. And how many of you went? (laughs) Yes. Exactly. So poetry lives among us. It bubbles up in surprising ways, in riddles, in ballads, through songs. The word dwells among us and not with us, uh, not above us. And I work in a a place with a very intense atmosphere, 80 to 100 homeless people, marginalised, vulnerable people coming through the doors each day. And it seemed to me that um, their ballads, their songs, as yet unwritten, was something that I should pay attention to. And so I'd written trying to put together a collection of poems about someone called Arthur, who was a poetic figure in that he may or may not be homeless, he may or may not exist, he may or may not be a king. He's a lot lot of things at the same time. So this first poem is When Pigeons Fall, um, and it's really the voice of Arthur. I think it's really important that the introduction to poems have very little to do with the poems themselves. So I'll just tell you about Nottingham, where I live, this ridiculously grand council house where all sorts of characters, hippies and protesters, um, sit on the steps as the Rolls Royces disgorging dignitaries um, weighed down with regalia go in and out. Um, so, when pigeons fall... And then I sat on the steps of the council house between the stone lions who seemed to be guarding something, I don't know what, a hint of marble within, uniforms. Do they not know that I am a king? That day I asked questions of the air, the pigeons, and these are my questions. When I look at my hand, who am I looking at? When pigeons fall from the sky, why are the cracks smoothed over, made blue again? The orange flag stirring above cars in motor mart. What country? What song are they singing? And this drum drum beat beach which says do this, do that. Every day hearing it, I know I've left my sword somewhere. Spurs, fealty, quest. Words people heard and answered, now all tumbled by the side of the road. No one, not even my key worker who has the answer to everything in her filing cabinet, can answer these questions. Why does the fountain seem triumphant? And why can I recognize the joy when I can't remember it? What do I sound like when I speak? 
And most of all, where among the pigeons is the one who cries, you, you? When will the doorways pour light onto my waiting head? My uh, second poem is, um, picks up a theme which is also in G- Gavin's chapter about um, death row and uh, comes from childhood memory really of hunched over old women, I'll come to think of it, they probably about my age, uh, looking back, <laughs> women <laughs> um, reciting the rosary extremely fast, and I mean extremely fast, some of you may know what I'm talking about. And it seems to me that the leader of those women who sort of knew all the odd prayers that Aunt Hail Mary's, you know, on the, the bit at the end of the rosary with the crucifix on it, seemed to me very holy and important. Remembering Earl, one small cabbage, one pound pots, one packet streaky, if cheap, rosary at eight, right to Earl. The butter sputters in my bent pan, smearing Nora's postcard of the bridge of size, which I'd always imagined as puffs of breath like broken beads, barely holding their own. Our breaths froze in the dark mornings as we carried cabbage and bacon to the boys. That pearl of air was part of me, but where's it gone? You have some fancies, says Nora. She thinks I'm simple, writing to death row, but it's not easy. Just be yourself, the lady from Amnesty said. During the sorrowfuls, I saw his black finger tracing my writing on the airmail paper. During the joyfuls which Nora gabbles, I saw the rare light like a medal on his breastbone. During the glorious mysteries, his breath rose from behind the walls like a long-held note, his whole lost body failing to come out. The last poem I'm going to read um, has a pigeon in it. The last one, Remembering Earl, is one of the few poems I've ever written without a pigeon in it. (laughs) Uh, Maybe you... Eleanor was talking about uh, the genre, so maybe there's some sort of award category. (laughs) Greatest Pigeon Poems of 1979. (laughs) But there are pigeons in this one, and it uh, draws on, um, as my chapter does, on some of the work of um, Michael Deserto, scholar, Jesuit poet, who poignantly now did some of his research from one of the Twin Towers. So the 110th floor, the title of my poem, uh, is no longer... And I didn't try to address that overtly, somehow in the poem that emerged. And I've conflated the figure of Michael Deserto with the angel in um, one of my favourite films, Wim Wenders' Wings of Desires. He watches over the Berliners in Berlin. From the 110th floor. Pitched between twin and twin, the endless thin skin of sky, he watched uncertain always of the unseen, tugging like tides between the grid of West Side Highway and Vasey Street, silent traffic, the angled yellow cabs packed like bees. He repeated notions from unfinished chapters, consolations and desolations as familiar as his own circulating blood, rushed up one tower and down the next, blending as they always would into one. It's hard to be up when you're down. Must one descend, fall back finally into the dark space where crowds move back and forth? On the other hand, they are in the arms of lovers, a fall of grace. He extended his fused fingers, the wing of his body covered the pigeons, their stratagems. start with a poem called Rummage. What's this here rummage, says my dad, staring at his plateful. Partly it's performance, the line he knows I'll expect him to say, presented with a dish of pasta. Lasagna, I hear myself answer too primly. Go on, you'll enjoy it. Like the pizza, he and my stepmother still remember the only time they came to visit me in London. 
It's what he can get his tongue around, like bulls and cows and how to grow beans and how many deaths there are in the Western morning news of people he knows. It's food, but it could be so much more. The work I do, the words I've learned to fill my mouth with, company I keep, all as exotic as the tangle of peppers, lentils and savoury juices he doesn't recognise on his plate. I know he'll not decipher them now. This is as close as we'll get. A plate full of pasta and the weight in the air of all the strangeness he'll never have words for and I'll never be able to translate. At one level that's an intensely personal poem about my relationship between, with, my, with my own father. But I wanted to read it as well because it's perhaps part of my struggle as a feminist poet, part of what I, what I write about both in my poetry and in some of my prose theology is about um, that sense of a gap between two worlds and two discourses, the world of the father, the world of the daughter, that we speak different languages, that we try to reach out and communicate, that we often fail. So I suppose some of my writing has been about a critique of patriarchy, but also the kind of gap between worlds and trying to find a different place to inhabit. And then there's the work of reconstruction of women's history, which many feminist historians and theologians and biblical critics have been concerned with. And the second poem I want to read um, is, is kind of is, is in that territory. It's really a very simple list poem. And um, I should probably dedicate it to Ruth because it's partly due to Ruth that I came to write it. So at one point Ruth was director of the Subtle Poetry Festival. Some of you might know Subtle Minster, which is a beautiful gem of a building. Um, and it's particularly famous for its chapter house, um, which has got beautiful carved sort of foliage. But I, I, I was invited with my partner to uh, write a series of poems about women in the Minster. So we were kind of searching for signs of women in this beautiful church building. And the chapter house is full of images in various stages of um, decomposition or faces that have half survived or faces that have been partly destroyed. And many of them are women's faces. And this poem really is just a list of those women's faces. Chapter house women. Long-nosed, wimpled woman smirking. A young queen or princess thinking. Woman with long hair riding indeterminate beast. Nun holding the martyr's wheel. Gagged woman clasping her hands. Woman with a headdress, nose defaced. Girl, right side of face scratched, scarred nose sheared off. Woman with hair perfectly in place, mouth and nose missing. Crone with bottom half of face worn away, eyes staring. Fat-faced green woman spewing foliage. Young girl with floral tiara. Woman with features erased. Matron in bonnet and chin piece, eyes wide, lips pursed. Woman grinning. Woman looking angry. Woman's face covered with leaves, half choking. The other side, perhaps, of trying to retrieve women's lost history from the shards and um, the broken, defaced remains is to remythologize uh, religious texts um, and to, um, to read 
women where they have not been or where they are between the spaces. And I've done that in a whole variety of different ways. Um, and I've been particularly interested in the whole symbol of the female Christ figure, the so-called Christa. And I've written a whole sequence of poems revisiting some of the gospel stories um, and imagining what if it was a woman. And so I'm going to read you a poem, It's a Girl. Fairly obvious, I don't really need to read the poem, but I'm gonna... <laughs> I will do. It's not a very long poem. It's a girl. The news spread like wildfire. Sages were perplexed. Astronomers recalculated their stars. Shepherds sloped back to their charges. Only the midwives smiled their knowing smiles, and the angels crowded round, singing, Glory, glory. <laughs> Time for one more. Um, this is another Christa poem, and it's called At the Table of Christa. And this really tries to imagine what might Christian liturgy, and particularly Christian Eucharist, look like if, um, if women were in charge. And I know it wouldn't always look like this, but this is my hope. And it sometimes looks like, this when, looks like this when men are in charge as well, I should say. At the Table of Christa. The women do not serve, but are served. The children are not silent, but chatter. The menfolk do not dominate, but cooperate. The animals are not shushed away, but are welcomed. At the table of Christa, there is no seat of honour, for all are honoured. There is no etiquette, except the performance of grace. There is no dress code, except the garments of honesty. There is no fine cuisine other than the bread of justice. At the table of Christa, there is no talk of betrayal, but only of healing and hopefulness. No money changes hands, but all know themselves rich in receiving. Death is in no one's mind, but only the lust for life. No one needs to command, remember, and no one present can ever forget. Five minutes before we can then rush to the wine and nibbles and orange juice, etc. Um, but we welcome anything you want to say, and if you'd like to ask a question to a particular person, do so. And if you don't necessarily know who to address, we decided that since I know know us, I can direct the question to who might be the best person to begin a conversation on that point. So, over to you, Emma. I have a question for Ruth, but Gavin, if you'd like to direct it, you can. Um, you said something quite interesting that I think I want to point out about art and about how art ought to uh, tell us something about the age and if it doesn't, it's failing. And I thought that was interesting because when I think of the best Christian poets like T.S. Eliot, what's so interesting and charming about that is it times them. And I wonder whether or not how it, what it's reflecting about the age is supposed to be, is that something that's incidental? Or is that a good agenda in the art? Or is it just something that the best art happens to do? Well, thank you for a very fine question. Um, and I hope my colleagues will chip in. Um, uh, I suppose when I said that it should give an account of the age, I didn't mean in a sort of historical replication or even um, any, ki- any kind of narrative that would speak directly of what was happening in those times or was any kind of historical. It's rather as, you know, we read the scriptures not necessarily as a historical document, but that in some way in the words and in the spaces between the words and in the emotion conveyed, there is something 
particular, there is something contextual about what that poem can generate and how it can affect people reading it. Not that it's necessarily localised or circumscribed by um, local colour in that sort of direct way. Any additions? I mean, if you want to come back on that. Sure. I'm not sure I'd agree that Elliot is timeless, actually. <laughs> no, I, I, it's, it's a high tone which we no longer use, which gives, sort of seems to be addressing in a very universal sense. But I think that you know, people describe him as the first modern poet and that in his form and in the in the, the, the way that he wrote, he was breaking all sorts of traditions about what poetry should be. And in that way, I think he's very particular to his time and his uh, references to war and the broken nature of some of the longer poems, which spoke the fragmentation of the times, I think is quite particular to but some... I think it's going through the particularity that he then is going through the local property, tapping into something which is more than that. Yes. And that's sort of, of it's course. challenging it upwards always. It feels that like something is particular... Yes, I, I think that's right. I'm not sure about upwards, but no, no, I no, broadly no. agree. <laughs> but isn't that the job of poetry? In the early remarks, it was suggested that in order to meet, one has to have an agenda. Does one have to have an agenda in order to meet? Did people hear that at the back? <laughs> Great. Uh, I no, you, no, yeah. I, no, I, no, one doesn't have to have an agenda to meet, but I think we did, that first meeting, we were gathering to work out if there was enough there for us to kind of have an ongoing conversation, but that was all I meant, really. Um, the only agenda I think we have when we meet is to read our poems and to respond to them, and to see what kind of emerges out of that. And to eat. <laughs> 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 so what? Um, to any of you who wish to answer linguistically or sonorically, have you any particular models that have inspired you? I don't know. Do you want to have a shot for that? Um, that's interesting. As, as a child, the the poet that really excited me was Robbie Burns, and I think that was to do with a rhythmic, lyrical, zestful, perceptive just combination of talent. Much more recently, I've been inspired by UA Fanthorpe, a Quaker a woman, a poet, and the Guardian thought that she should have been poet laureate. I couldn't believe it. So, um, I just, um, I have, yeah, I've been very moved over and over again by astuteness and irony and compassion and so on in her work. Hmm. Any, anyone want to just add to that question about the model? Mark? Um, I'm, ver I'm very moved by the, the poetry of R.S. Thomas. Um, and I, I, I like to say that he, he kind of saved my soul in the sense that when I hit my kind of um, first conscious doubts about faith when I was a teenager I, I started reading him and found that he could hold doubt um, as, as a dimension of faith and, and, and he kind of kept me in the faith in that sense that, I, um, that it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a journey of discovery uh, but I love the way he distills um, ideas and feelings and uh, perspectives and his, the way his poetry is so austere and clear that whiskey though he was well <laughs> yes, <sorry. that's> a good <laughs> one. I think, it's, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's one thing to say the poets that we've enjoyed reading mm. um, and it's another thing really to know and I think maybe it's, a, it's very difficult to know which of the poets who have most influenced one's own work uh, I think yeah, I'd be hard put to say that. Um. It, is, it is interesting how, um, I mean, going back to Eliot, white male, nearly fascist at times, the kind of 
when I sort of start reading someone that I haven't read for a long time, I start uh, mimicking or trying to do this type of work without thinking about it. So at the last meeting, I was reading something out uh, to the poets, and they said, oh, that has this Eliot quality, uh, which, you know, uh, clearly not as good as Eliot or anything. No, but it, it, it was interesting that I'd been reading Eliot for weeks and listening to him on YouTube, and uh, it had begun to shape. And when I went to Japan, I started writing or trying to write haikus. So it's, it's kind of fun experimenting with different forms, especially, I think, someone who's trying to learn the craft. You know, so there's that sense of experimentation. Um, but I've, I've just got... Did, did you want to, to kind of add to this conversation? Yes, it is. Oh, well, go on. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm sorry about asking such a question. It sounds inquisitive, but um, has any one of you um, studied poetry, or do you write spontaneously from what you feel, and you read other poets just to to understand poetry? But have you gone into deep into problem of poetry? Just for the back, uh, the question was, have any of us studied poetry, or like Keats, it comes as natural as leaves to the tree? Um, right, go on, we can now <laughs> expose ourselves in terms well, of... different forms of study, isn't there? So I want to say, yes, I have studied poetry, but not... Um, it, English was always the great love of my school days, and I made a conscious decision, in fact, not to read... English at university, but to read theology, because I knew I would always carry on reading and studying poetry if I read theology, but not vice versa. And I used to sneak out from most of my theology, or a lot of my theology lectures, to go off to listen to the, you know, the English lectures. So, um, so it's been a more informal process, but I, I, I absolutely believe that it's impossible to write well, without soaking yourself in the work of other poets, in the same way that you know, how can you do good theology if you don't read some of the classic texts? And you might want to argue with them and wrestle with them and you know do something different. But I think again, that's part of learning the craft. You have to soak yourself in in a huge amount of different sorts of um, poetry. So it's an it's an informal, ongoing um, process. But, I think I'd say something very similar, so I won't repeat it. I mean, I've done classes ranging from sort of small informal groups right through to a year-long course that I, I did in London. Um, what I do think is important is to be part of groups from time to time. And if you're, you know, judging competitions that Nicholas done and I've done, um, maybe others from time to time, or working, uh, leading classes, you can actually tell who's in a group and who isn't. Some of that's to do with what Nicholas said about that. You know about that immersion in who, what what other people are writing and that sort of critical capacity to stand back from your own from your own work. Yeah, I would just add that as well as being in this illustrious poetry group, um, I'm also in an even more illustrious one, the Coventry Live Poets, and we make a point of sharing our own work critically once a month and once a month meeting to read a range of poet, poetry by poets of the past, present, in translation, and so on, and to, and to look um, critically at it. Yep, so from uh, age four, I was, a, I was a choir boy, so I used to sing the Psalms most days, <laughs> so they kind of studied me in a way, all the way up to 18. Uh, I did read English at university, but that, that my experience of that, I know it wouldn't be like that now, cause, but kind of 30 years ago, I think it was a bit, reading English was uh, a bit like kind of the difference between being studying anatomy and being a ballet dancer, you know, we were, we were taught to tear things apart, uh, that, that was how it was now, I'm sure it wouldn't be like that now. Then it was, but not like that now. But um, but also, yeah. I mean, um, in terms of the Christian scriptures, there are estimates that they're almost one third poetry, mainly the Hebrew scriptures, but one one third. And I mean, interestingly, a bit. Well, Nikki was decisive and chose to do theology, 
And I thought I couldn't bear losing either English or theology, so I actually did a, a joint honours for my first degree. And realised, rather like Eleanor's poem about where the boundaries are between different genres, that I wasn't quite sure what the difference was at certain times between the two disciplines, and often found the most moving and powerful theology in novels or in poems. And in one sense, the, uh, the whole question of writing theology then becomes problematized because there isn't a kind of clean genre fit. But I, I think one interesting thing is that I was quite intimidated when studying English. I didn't actually write much because I had this sense that, well, I think I still have a sense it's bad, but I think I'm getting too old and I think I should do it anyway. Because, you know, that's, but when I was younger, I think I did more painting because I couldn't uh, do English, uh, couldn't do poems without feeling rather overcritical about them. Um, and I can't, uh, yes, I think like Mark, my, uh, or that sense of being involved in a tradition where there's recitation is a remarkable training, isn't it? Um, and certainly uh, living for a short time when I went to visit my sister in Cairo in a, Mus in a Muslim culture, having that sense of poetry being part of the culture because it's just out there in the public space, the call and the singing and such like. Tess. If, if more of an observation that started And I was expecting things about sort of the nature of God or the divine, and I was surprised that that didn't appear to be what it was at all. And I guess I was just wondering if that's if that is part of it anywhere. I think it started off as something different, and it's moved into what it is now. Hmm. often comes at things obliquely. So, um, I mean, we do have poems with the G word, and you know, I certainly have written a lot, although I find myself writing less and less, because, um, I mean, and that's, you know, exploring the texture of experience, whatever it is, whether it's walking past a shop of, you know, women's underwear, um, or, or, I don't know, getting a bit of, you know, is that a religious poem? Is getting a, the communion bread stuck in your tea? Is that a religious poem because it's about communion? I, I think, it, you know, I think you want to say, um, you know, writing the poem to, a, 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 we talk, we, it's about an attitude to, of perhaps of reverence, of, you know, attentive looking for signs of the divine in the ordinary. Um, so poems, you know, don't have, they can be about anything. It's not what they're about that makes them either spiritual or not spiritual. It's kind of about the quality of attention we bring to that experience. It's about, you know, what we're able to perceive within that. Um, Although I, I think interestingly, if, uh, this is not a plug for the book, but if you uh, read Nikki's, Mark's, and mine, there's much more of a conscious attempt to interact with narratives yeah. from the biblical tradition. Yeah. And, well, as, as in terms of the reading, we've seen that. And shifting maybe a traditional take on it. But that's a sort of entree into uh, that concern at one level, which is quite tradition-specific. But there's also that sense in which I think in all of the poems, you know, sitting on the bus uh, becomes a very significant moment without necessarily having to have that biblical narrative to make it so. Um, but it's also interesting, I mean, lots of poets revisit <coughs> classic texts, yeah. whether they're scriptural texts, whether they're, you know, from the Greek classics, whatever. Um, does, again, and lots of secular poets do that, or poets without over religious faith. So just because one is revisiting a, sure. mm. a scriptural narrative and reworking it, again, does that mean it's a religious poem? I, I, I think it's... Yeah, the, the, the lines are very complicated, the are very, aren't they? And very moving. blurred, aren't they? Mm, that's, sorry, this... Uh, my question's from Mark. 
Hi. Um, you mentioned the Psalms and you mentioned Bible being full of poetry. Uh, and in the introduction, uh, we, we heard that you are interested in liturgy. Mm. So my question is, do you have any thoughts about words for worship and what we presently have, for instance, in the Anglican Church as liturgy? And have you written any poetry for corporate worship? Um, I've written some, probably more, um, more, more um, poetical prayers than, 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 but some, some liturgy, and particularly um, a, a reflection on um, the prologue to John's Gospel, uh, which also involves some drama as well, for a, for a big conference. Um, so it was it kind of enacted words. Um, and I think, um, uh, for, for myself, I think um, liturgy is, is profoundly important in, in the sense that it, it, it instills a sense of rhythm, a sense of how words and silence fit together, um, and a, a sense of being able to allude to uh, the divine and, not, and um, perhaps gesture or point towards the divine and make a sense of the divine very present without diminishing. So somehow the words that evoke a sense of, of God um, don't thereby limit God. Except that I am conscious that, you know, some of our liturgy is very gender specific, some of it uh, is, is very kind of culture bound. Uh, so it can be imprisoning. Um, I, speaking as a kind of kind of employed Anglican, I'm, I'm a bit tired of the kind of waves of new liturgy that that seem to emerge in the industry of people writing liturgies and ever more ever more services. But I love experimental liturgy and the kind of stuff that, for example, uh, Nicola has 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 offered the Christian community. You know, I, I, I really enjoy. So sorry, that's a very muddled <laughs> answer. <laughs> yeah, but perhaps, perhaps Nicola has had more, more comment. Did you want to add to that? Because you've done quite a, a lot of liturgical Yes, I've written a lot of kind of, um, being part of that sort of feminist, alternative feminist liturgical movement. Um, and I think that there's a very... Although you're using some of the same skills in writing poetry and writing literature, I think they are different. Mm. And you know, poetry can be entirely idiosyncratic and particular, um, whereas I think liturgy, although it has to, you know, it, it, you're writing for collective use, so it, 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 I think good liturgy is kind of fresh. It's got <clears> the creativity and originality of good poetry, but it, it can't be idiosyncratic in the same way. It has to be something that can be shared collaboratively by, you know, by a, maybe a very wide range of um, individuals. Um, so they're slightly different, yeah. different tasks, I think. And I think certainly with, when you get to public worship, how do you hold together the, the completely spontaneous creative and the, the fact that really the liturgy has to articulate what is held to be true corporately so there's that tension as well so what you do in private might be, or, or in a, in a self selecting group is one thing if you're holding public worship don't you have to articulate something which is creedal so there are tensions given we've got a five, five minutes max there's a question right at the back in the corner that's yourself and the news and maybe if we could have both of them together and make sure you get your innings. And Sarah, did you put your hand up? Great, so we'll have you as well. Right. Um, well, my question is actually about the theme of journey which um, resonated with me. And I think anyone who's ever written um, a poem feels that journey in the writing of the poem and feels that transformative element that sometimes can come. Before you write a poem that unsettles angry feeling and during when you're kind of trying to reconcile things and then the after that sense of peace or satisfaction or walking away and finish. I was wondering if you or maybe one of the panel 
can share a story of a particular poem where you really remember that sense of journey and 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 maybe a, like a yeah a transformative kind of change. Mm, mm. Thank you. Um, I'm always loved and been intrigued by the scripture that says, in the beginning was the word. And I don't hear what you have to say. I've never, I've never, I've never, I've never, you know, to the way that I, I know it's true, that resonates is right, but I don't know. Thank you. And Sarah, last question. Right, so we've got <laughs> three minutes, three questions, a minute and answer. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll just have a shot at the first. Uh, I, this is a poem in the book, actually, which is having gone to visit a pen friend on death row in Florida and feeling in real turmoil about it. It just brought up so many complicated things. And a very, you know, I mean, I think this poetry is therapeutic at one level. You know, it's some sense of trying to make sense of something that is very difficult. Um, and by being able to get a form that was satisfying, it didn't actually make sense of the complexity of things, but it just helped. And it's analogous to having a good conversation with a friend where something begins to make sense. And that helps. Right, one minute for the second question. <laughs> The beginning was the word. Sorry, you opening your mouth. Go ahead. <laughs> well, um, yeah, what do I say? Um, po well, poetry comes from poesis, which is to make or to do. And I think certainly um, that, that idea of the word, of, you know, the idea of God speaking or creating, doing something... <laughs> And that, that dynamic of the d divine giving birth to something beautiful and um, constructed, and I think that image that when, when also when we talk about God's image in us, that's how we reflect the divine, that we also uh, give, give birth, we make and we do, we create, and we love beauty. Where does it come from? Heart, mind, soul, which bit? Guts. <laughs> I think it's, a, a, on a good day, <laughs> I think it's a synthesis. And I, not to miss out pure craft either. You know, the slaving around the page, the, the piles in the waste paper basket, the, the walks around the room, the cups of coffee, and, you know, studying poetry and knowing something about the, the form and craft. So I think, I think a poem that, um, I don't know if anyone's ever happy with a poem, but if you feel if you feel at the end of the day's work writing a poem that, that this has worked, I think it's a synthesis of all those elements that you mentioned. And going to your question as well, I mean, I, one thing I'd be certain of in this very uncertain, mysterious territory is that my poems are different. Uh, as a woman of faith, I know that my poems would be different were I not. Of course, I don't know what those poems would be. But that's something I'm actually very confident about, that even though I'm not directly addressing or overtly addressing those themes, that it's coming from that very central part of me, which you know, is also uh, a life of faith. So I, I, sometimes I start with a title, sometimes it's something you see on the street, sometimes it's, it takes 20 years <laughs> for something that has happened to work its way into a poem. So... I think it's a mysterious area, but I, I think that if it's left to one faculty alone, then possibly the poem wouldn't work quite so well. Before handing back to Ed, I'd just like to uh, point out to someone in the audience here, who's Sarah, who is our publisher, Sarah Wave, because um, in a sense, you know, we, we kind of meet and eat and 
uh, do all this stuff, but it was uh, a great privilege and trust to be taken on by a reputable publisher uh, and who has turned up and driven all the way with her dog in the car uh, to be here for this event. So thank you very much, Sarah. say is a huge thank you to the five of them and thank you for what you've shared with us sharing your poem and I think for at least one of you it's the first time that you've given a public airing to your poem so thank you for the, the risk that you've taken um, and for, for starting to lift that veil of, of what happens for you when you divine when you um, what happens how it looks how it feels for you um, Mark mentioned R.S. Thomas and um, I know Eleanor actually quotes from R.S. Thomas in, in her chapter in here, and he's explaining what poetry is for him, and he says, poetry is that which arrives at the intellect by way of the heart. So perhaps that links in with the, the last question that we had. Um, but thank you all, thank you for coming, uh, thank you for your questions and comments.